It's good to see you here. Hey, Lisa. Oh, I can see some names that I am recognizing. Just going to give a couple minutes for people to join us. And then I will flip the camera around. So we are going to be talking about, hey, is that Lynn? Lynn Martin? Or is it D. Lynn? <laughs> Tell me your names because always your handles just completely throw me off. Hi, Lisa. Yes, Lynn. Okay, <laughs> good. Hey, Sandra. Hi, Erica. Hi, Kim. Hey, if anybody wants to share this, if you are, you, like, invite other people to come in. Hey, Marjor, Marjor, or Marjorie, I think. Julie, Joshua, Angie, Kristen, Marjorie. <laughs> yep. So if you want to invite people, if you're on an Android, swipe up, and then you can hit uh, share, or you can... Um, also hit follow if you want to be notified of these later on. If you are on an iOS or on a, uh, you know an Apple phone, what do you call that? iPhone, swipe right, and then you'll have the option to share or invite other people to join us. So I am going to go ahead and flip around now. Hey, it is great to see everybody here. Ah, if this is a completely brand new thing for you and you just jumped in. Hey, good to see, uh, yes, if you are a, a Teachers Pay Teachers person and you're going to be going to the conference in Orlando, I'm going to be uh, presenting there. I'm going to be sharing some research-based practices that, um, that can be turned into great educational products. So I'm going to go ahead and set this phone down. Hi. Hey, Jason. I attempted to make my periscopes less depressing by putting a little painting behind me. <laughs> We are in the process of uh, getting ready to move into a new house, and we actually moved some of our stuff, and then it was looking like we weren't going to get the house, so we moved some of it back. Long story, and you all are here to talk about other stuff, but, well, Jason, the color behind me, I'm in like an olive green room, and it's just, I don't know. So, um, I wanted to just, if you are... If you've been watching my Periscopes for a while, or if you're brand new, I just, since I've been doing these now for about two months, I realized, no, I'm not doing Snapchat yet. I, I got my account so that I could have the name, but I do not understand Snapchat at all. If it sticks and it really becomes a thing, then I'm sure I'll learn it, but this and Instagram are both my new things this year, and it is about enough. So, what I was going to say is... um. I'm starting to see these periscopes as kind of like rough drafts for blog posts, you know, because really what I do, and this is kind of where I see my role in general, um, just as a job really, is that I try to take the stuff that you guys wish you had time to research and learn more about and I have the time to go and dig through research and dig through resources to find the stuff that is going to be the most helpful to you. It's, you know, I'm almost seeing myself sometimes as an educational concierge. So, um, uh, do I not get jaded with Periscope? You mean because of all the creepers? Yeah, I do. I had a pretty bad experience a few weeks ago, but it was a learning experience. So, anyway, my point in saying that these are rough drafts is that... I don't put as much time into preparing for these periscopes as I do for a blog post. But what's happening is that they're turning into basically rough drafts for later blog posts. I basically feel like I can get enough research done that I can share some useful information and then I get information from you all in the comments and then sometimes that can actually turn into a really good long-lasting blog post. Thank you, Gil. So, um, so I say that to to basically act as a disclaimer um, that this is not a thorough description of all of the really best research I can find. It's just what I was able to dig up in a couple of hours. So what what today's Periscope is about, if you're not into teaching or education, uh, it's going to be boring for you because we're talking about vocabulary instruction and strategies that work best for teaching kids to improve their vocabulary. So if that is not something that interests you, um, now not Common Core, it's just vocabulary. I mean, we've been we've been trying to teach vocabulary since way, way, way before the Common Core. So I've had two different teachers 
Yes, I'm, I'm a teacher. I was, I was a teacher. I now work full time to help teachers improve what they do. So I have had questions from two different readers Uh, about vocabulary and here are their two separate situations one was a teacher whose uh, principal wanted her to teach from a um, a vocabulary book okay and wanted to make sure that you know she covered like a unit per week and she had 20 units to cover in this vocabulary book and she was feeling like she could not get them all covered so she also felt like, you know, it was getting in the way of a lot of other, you know, instruction and a, lo- a lot of other things that she could have been doing. So she thought she wanted basically my opinion on whether or not I felt that teaching from a vocabulary book was really effective. Then I have another teacher who does kind of like a resource class um, where she teaches kids who are kind of falling behind and, you know, needed a little bit of extra support. And, um, she wanted to just, spe- she only saw these kids for an hour a week and she really wanted to spend some time building their vocabulary because she could see that that was really a problem in some of the stuff that they um, were t- getting tested on. So she w- wanted to know how could she ba- basically make the most of this time. So to me, both of these teachers are looking for, you know, information on what's the best way to teach vocabulary. So anytime I do these periscopes, if I have resources to actually share with people, um, that's a good question. I'm not exactly sure. I've heard the term word study a lot more lately. A, a lot of times when I do these periscopes, I end up finding a lot of articles that I want you to be able to get to. So I'm going to go ahead and flip this around and show you how you can find those. Just never seems to work that well. Um, if you go to my website, it's just not going to work today. Okay, so my website is Cult of Pedagogy. Uh, if you go to Cult of Pedagogy slash Periscope, uh, every time I have stuff to share, I will just add a link to that page. And so this week I've got a link to a page of basically what I'm going to talk about and plus some, some resources. Okay. So here's what I found uh, about vocabulary. Number one, the thing that I found in all of the research that I looked at was that hands down, reading widely is the most effective long-term way to boost vocabulary. So if you are in a school where your administrator is really wanting you to spend as much time as possible on things like vocabulary worksheets and quizzes and more worksheets and workbooks and that sort of thing, exactly, let this administrator know that really what's going to build vocabulary the most is if students have time to read. And that is reading stuff that has rich vocabulary in it and things that are going, that is what is really going to improve their vocabulary. It's because the words are in context, yes, but it is, it's also because it's those kinds of exposures that kids who read a lot just have a big vocabulary because they're exposed to, you know, different words and they're, they're exposed to them Uh, in different contexts and in different kinds of, you know, um, sentences. So they see them over and over again. I'm seeing so many resources coming up here, which is fantastic. I'm going to set you down again so that I'm not bouncing the phone around. Okay. Struggling to get them to read. That that would be a completely separate um, uh, topic. But I'll tell you, if you're struggling to get students to read and to work out new ways of getting reading uh, enjoyment in your classroom more, I would highly recommend reading Donna Lynn Miller's book called The Book Whisperer. Uh, Really excellent and just so liberating in terms of really changing the way that you teach so that there's just a whole lot more reading for pleasure and and a whole lot less time in test prep. I'll, I'll give you real quick, this is a side, sidebar, but basically what she did was she stopped doing all kinds of, you know, different kinds of drills and test prep, and she just really, really helped her students discover a love of independent, self-selected reading and just brought in so many books and really talked them up. And I'm not doing it justice at all, but her kids' test scores went up. They did not do really any test prep. They just read a lot. So anyway, Donna Lynn Miller, the book, the book whisperer, really, really excellent. 
So that's that's how you can get, and yes, thank you. She's also read a book called Reading in the Wild. That one I didn't read, but I've heard that one a lot. Okay, so that's the key point, number one, is improving vocabulary, give them time to read. Okay, but if you are going to be teaching, uh, I learned a, a bunch of new stuff today. First of all, I discovered somebody who has a whole lot of stuff on her website, and her name is Kimberly Tyson, T-Y-S-O-N, and I'm linking to some of her resources in this Um, this page. If you don't know what page I'm talking about, if you just joined me, go to my website, cultofpedagogy.com. And if you can't understand what I'm saying, it's my handle on Periscope too. And it's actually in my profile, cultofpedagogy.com and then add a slash Periscope. That's where I'm keeping all of my Periscope resources. So I link to some of Kimberly Tyson's uh, resources. She's just got a whole lot of good stuff. And she's actually coming out with a book this summer called Blended Vocabulary, which I am going to make sure that people know about. If you're following me on Facebook or Twitter or something, then you will find it. Oh, I can see somebody's in the document now. Good. So, okay. One of the things that Kimberly Tyson has talked about is that there is there is this concept that I'm just learning about today called um, tiered vocabulary, T-I-E-R. So tier, tier one, tier two, and tier three. Lisa, we're talking about the document that I've provided for this Periscope that's just got links to the resources that I'm going to be talking about. So if you go to cultofpedagogy.com slash Periscope, you will find today's date and a link to, to this. It's just a Google Doc that's got the different um, <laughs> different things. Okay, so tiered vocabulary. Basically, what Kimberly Tyson says and what other experts say is instead of looking at vocabulary as this big, large blob of all these words that I have to teach, she says really as teachers what we need to be doing is separating vocabulary words into three separate tiers, okay? Tier one vocabulary words, and we sort of can decide this. I think there are people out there that are creating these lists, but we decide what goes in each tier. Tier one is everyday words that people just use all the time, words like just functional vocabulary words, bathroom and bed and pencil and that kind of stuff. Everybody knows these words. These aren't necessarily words we need to teach. Tier two is academic terms that cross-curricular boundaries. These are words like explain, expand, predict, summarize, um, but a lot a lot of other words like this that if you teach them in science and you teach them in language arts and you teach them in math, they, they can mean similar things, but they can also have different meanings in those different contexts. So what she says and what other people are saying is that we really, really need to focus on teaching students those words because they are so widely used in so many academic contexts that if the kids really get a handle on those words and how they work and what they mean in those different contexts, they can then learn other vocabulary words really, really well. So definitely make sure that you focus on those. And there's a link to a better explanation of what these tiered academic words are. Tier three, by the way, Thank you for keeping mentioning the Freyer model. I do not even have the Freyer model in this list. And so I'm going to make a note of that. I'm going to watch this Periscope later. I'm going to make a note of that because I know I've referred to it in another blog post. And so I want to make sure that if I ever turn this one into a blog post that that makes it in there because that sounds so familiar to me. And I think I remember liking it a lot and seeing that it worked really well. Tier three, those are the nice to know words but they're so specialized that they're not as important as the tier two words. So when you're, when you're considering what words to teach them, think about that. Think about what kinds of academic words are we going to be using in the near future that our kids need to know. And even better, get together with your other teachers of other content areas, okay? By the way, in general, most of the resources that I was looking at today do not seem to be in favor of uh, vocabulary workbooks that have a word list per week where you give them on Monday and they do the definitions and they do the exercises and then they, then they test on Friday. There doesn't seem to be a whole lot of support for that for a couple of reasons. One, they're sort of out of context. The kids are not likely to encounter these words in a lot of other situations. They're sort of isolated, even though, I mean, they're probably good words to know, but they're pulled out of context. Also, just the rush in general, it is better to do fewer words for a longer period of time where the kids are going to get multiple exposures to them. 
So I just did not see a whole lot of support for them. Most of the stuff I saw said do fewer words in longer spans of time. Okay. So, right, SAT. And I do think, you know, I think if a kid is preparing for the SAT, sometimes you almost can't do anything but just keep drilling. But nothing makes up for years and years of, of reading. Uh, good, I see a comment on spelling. I actually did do a Periscope on spelling a couple weeks ago. So if you wanted to see that, all of my replays, if you look at my Periscope profile, there is a link to something called catch, catch.me, and I've got all of my old Periscopes there. So if you wanted to watch some of those, that's where they are. Okay, so first two principles. Number one, read widely. Number two, teach academic vocabulary. And and number three, to truly learn learn, learn, to truly learn vocabulary, students need multiple exposures to words in meaningful, varied contexts. So what that means is that you don't just have them read the definition. Um, you don't just have the word appear in a sentence. It's going to pop up frequently. And here's another thing that I learned, and I didn't know that this system existed, but Marzano, and a lot of us are familiar with Robert Marzano's name, um, just being connected with a lot of research-based instruction. He developed a six-step vocabulary process. My my gut tells me that there are probably a lot of systems like this. So I link to it in this document. I link to Marzano's. I think there are probably a lot of other comparable um, systems, which basically involve early exposure to the word and then another kind of exposure, whether it's through drawing a picture that represents it, some kind of non-linguistic representation, and then maybe seeing the word in a sentence, and then maybe hearing it in a story, and then having using the words come up or in a conversation or something like that. So the idea is multiple exposures in meaningful contents context. Um, I did see some research on learning Latin roots instead of just random lists. And I just kind of ran out of time to pull that in here. But I do think and I think later on, I'm going to I'm glad you noted that I will make a note of looking for that too, because there was a whole lot of research in favor of giving kids tools to learn more words as opposed to just teaching them a set of words. So in other words, if you teach them the Latin root, then they can learn 60 new words that have that root as opposed to here are 20 words that have nothing to do with each other. So I do believe that there is some research, too, on pulling words apart and looking at some roots. Any of you who have resources, I so appreciate what you're doing right now is just adding to me just the names of people because I can look all this up later and I can pull together a really, really nice comprehensive uh, blog post with all this stuff in it. Okay. I have one more point. I'm going to drink, drink some tea first, though. Okay, last summer, every summer I do a book study, and I, I've i already picked two for this summer, and I cannot wait to announce them because they're going to be so good. Um, but I'm not going to announce them yet. Last summer, I did just one book, and it's a book called Make It Stick. Uh, thank you, Lisa. Thank Lisa's got the, the link there, and I think that's the link to this. Um, no, that's to something else. I'll look at that later. The book is called Make It Stick, and it is basically about neuro, the neuroscience of learning, what happens in our brain when we learn, and what things make us learn stuff for a longer period of time that really sticks it in, thank you, sticks it in our long-term memory, and what other stuff just flies right out. And the point of the book is that educators are doing a whole lot of stuff that is opposite to what brain research tells us about how the body or the brain remembers things. So two principles that I got, and yeah, I did a I did a whole bunch of basically pre-periscope periscopes where I just kind of like did videos that were looked just like this, where I talked about each chapter. I also interviewed one of the authors on my podcast. So there's a whole bunch of information and there's a link to that in this document too. I link it to my my website, which has all the other resources. Anyway, really good book. Two things that really stuck with me, stuck from that book, that I think apply to um, vocabulary instruction is, number one, you learn things better when you do short sessions spaced far apart, rather than we're going to have a vocabulary review on Thursday for Friday's test. Way, way better to do five minutes on Monday, 10 minutes on Tuesday, five minutes on Wednesday, do little mini sessions spaced further apart. The brain learns better 
when it is treated that way to, to multiple exposures. So whatever you're doing to study vocabulary with your students, instead of lumping everything all together, spread it out. The other principle of sticky learning is, t is testing. And I know that testing has become such a dirty word in education, but just hear me out for a second because I'm not talking about standardized testing. What the authors found is that when we test ourselves on our knowledge, the process of being tested actually builds new neural pathways in our brains. So, for example, if we want our students to really, really learn 10 words very well, instead of just having them stare at the list, what we can do is have them test each other. Say, what word means blah, 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 and then the kid tries to guess the word. Just that shift from looking at the information to actually trying to recall it. They, I think they call it retrie thank you, retrieval practice. That came at the perfect so time. Retrieval practice, which basically means you're testing yourself. And think about it. When we study for tests, at least those of us who got pretty good at studying, you, you pull somebody aside and say, okay, test me on this. Ask me these questions. That attempt to recall the information without having it in front of you, it actually makes you learn it better. And college teachers, they studied this with college instructors, the ones that gave one midterm and one final, their kids did way worse on, like if they tested the kids on that information like six months after the semester was over, compared with college instructors that gave a weekly quiz on the information and then a final. Just having a weekly quiz, regardless of how the, the students actually did on it, just the act of being quizzed on it, yes, it, that challenge really kind of reinforced that knowledge. Because you think about it, you take a quiz and then you go and you check to see how you did. And you check to see what the right answer was. And you check to see, you know, what, what did I do wrong on this? That is all learning. So there is actually a whole lot of value in that kind of testing. They call it low stakes testing in the book which is the opposite of what everybody's doing this month, which is high stakes testing, which is this test is going to punish somebody if you don't do well on it. Uh, low stakes testing actually is a great learning tool. So when you're studying vocabulary with your students, do these short little, you know, quizzes. I want you guys to just quiz each other on, on this week's, you know, list or this month's list or whatever it is. That type of activity in short bursts can really, really help students learn the words better. I want to see if I've got anything else here. So what I put at the end of this document, and if anybody is just joining me, um, if you go to cultofpedagogy.com slash periscope, there is a link to tonight's resources. Uh, I also just added four, um, four other resources, you know, sort of research summaries on vocabulary instruction. These will be especially useful for those of you who are right now teaching or being forced to teach with, um, you know, vocabulary workbooks and cover a certain amount of words per semester. These resources could probably really help you to maybe change the mind of the person who's making you do it. <laughs> so um, I am going to take just a second before I end this just to see if anybody has any questions or if you wanted to share any other resources um and then i'll then i'll go so i'm just gonna drink my tea for a minute and look at the comments oh i love seeing you guys saying hi to each other that's really nice especially <laughs> yeah okay call to pedagogy.com slash stick that's the information about make it stick hey mariel that's okay you can watch the replay <laughs> Thank you, Gil. Thank you. Thank you all so much. And you can also share these even after they're done. So if you wanted to, yeah, this is a good mug, right? We have a great potter in our town, and she sells these at the farmer's market. So I'm having some decaf tea tonight. Um, oh, cool. Somebody finally saw me live for the first time. I don't know if this is a terrible time or not. This is a good time for me to do Periscope. I'm in Bowling Green, Kentucky. Uh, because my daughter is at gymnastics and I have to go pick her up. And anyway, if I waited an hour later, Lynn Martin, you're in Bowling Green. Hang on. I want to just, I want to just check on that really quickly. 
I did, Marielle. I, I did. I scoped last week. I guess you missed it. But listen, you can always watch the replays. If you go to my profile, there are two URLs. One is to my regular website. And one is to my catch page. Catch is just a website that saves periscopes, basically. So they don't just die for, um, you know, after 24 hours. Anyway, 7.30, my time, central time, works well for me. Because in about 30 minutes, I got to start putting three kids to bed. And it's just too chaotic. Everybody's sort of like zoned out right now. So anyway, thank you all so much for joining me. This has been a very nice scope with no creepers except one um oh okay i got you i got you lynn and um i will be back next week and you guys want a preview of what i'm going to be talking about because i already know because i get all of these from reader emails oh okay next week we're going to be talking about what you do when your students badmouth other teachers to you when they say stuff like, you're my favorite teacher, all the other teachers suck, and I hate the way this one teaches, and I hate the way that one does this, or whatever. Like, what do you do in those situations? Because it's, I think it's really tricky to keep your ego in check and be professional. But that's going to be my point. So anyway, that's what we're going to talk about next week. Okay, I am going to, as always, attempt to end my Periscope with some level of grace. It never seems to happen. Oh, good, gossip. Okay, I'll bring that up too. All righty. <laughs> swipe down and I will see you all next week hopefully bye <laughs> she says bye as if <laughs>